sitting four with Jamie. Um, and did a tiny bit just just now, but I didn't have long to do much more to it. There's quite a lot to do to this one, um, but he's starting to go. I can feel a bit of his personality coming out to this picture. So we'll see what happens today. Chile. Should check my hair, really. Look at what a mess I am with Scarecrow. Oh no, he's not there now. He's doing a Dexter. Whew, God, it's hot, man. It is hot. River, your your best mate's here again. <laughs> He's wearing another fantastic outfit. You'll be very impressed. He's River. It's the bonus of having older sisters, I suppose. You've got some more exotic outfits yeah. than just an army outfit and a footballer. No, I've got a ribbon in my hair. You've got a ribbon in your hair, nice. That's lovely. Do you, oh, it's very long ribbon. It's about three metres long. Say hello oh. to Johnny. Here he is. <sighs> say hello, Hi, River. Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Oh. Are you going to say hello to him? No, I'm a bit bored. You're a bit bored? Yes, Johnny has this effect wow. on people as well, very regularly. <laughs> it usually takes them a couple of minutes to notice that though. <laughs> I just got back from London. Ah. So I made you by about 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> but mate, yeah, it's nice that summer's here. Oh, I'm, I'm losing you, hang on. Some of your strokes, work. Well, Depends what style you're doing, but in the style that I think you're doing, some of your strokes are quite broad. Yeah. So is does me being <laughs> pixelated make That's much a good difference? Question. I don't know actually. I mean, I hadn't really not consciously, but it might be that it's what it's like directing me a bit like that. Um, I mean, it's a bit more fun painting with broad brush strokes because you're doing bigger movements and you're playing with more you know, thicker paint and. But the fun of it is really that by being less precise, you're sort of suggesting more. Because that's the fun of these the paintings, is actually not that it's a very fixed expression like a photo is, but when you get a glimpse of people in different moods, what you want is a little glimpse of all the things they can be, because um, that makes for a more interesting picture. And particularly if some of those expressions are slightly contradictory, then that makes it even more intriguing to look at. And yeah, you know, theory, you know, these are things which you are not just a quick snapshot, but things you're gonna, they're gonna sit on the wall for years. And you want something which you wanna come back to because you're not sure what, what it, I can't quite read that one. You know, famously, the Mona Lisa you know, is a hard one to read, partly because Leonardo was playing tricks with the lighting and making it hard to read the corners of the mouth and eyes because he had the lighting from sort of in front and above. It was like he did all that. But therefore, you, you do find that more interesting when you, like, like yeah, maybe like with maybe humans. Exactly, we're intrigued by uncertainty. And the other thing is literally, the thicker the paint, the more it catches the light from funny directions. And so in different lighting circumstances, it'll also look slightly different. And it just kind of helps make the thing feel slightly alive in a kind of hard to define way. Jules, you know where I am. I'm with Johnny. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's all right. Hi, Jules. She's, she's calling me. How, how is she? She clearly, she clearly misses me. <laughs> Bless her. We had our 20th anniversary just like gone. Yeah, I saw your thing. That's so cool. I love the old footage as well. Oh, yeah. Wedding. We, so, we actually just, we'd lost our wedding video. And uh, So was that someone else's, was that other people's footage of it? Yeah, but we just found it, which okay. is quite, well, literally yesterday. Of course, that would have been just before everybody had video cameras on their phones. So, you know, if, you know nowadays, if you, your video didn't work and you had 200 people there, you've probably got 190 Versus. other videos. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you're so right. We were 18, I think, when we just got together. Amazing. And it's all been perfect. Nah, but it's been great, you know, it's, but it's been, yeah, of course it's nah. hard, isn't it? Marriage is hard. It's hard. Well, it's, just, it's up and down, really, isn't it? I mean, it's, that's, I mean kind of long relationships are... Are quite a you know require a lot of investment and patience and you know we've um, got quite similar wives though in some respects haven't we yeah yes i think they, we do, they, 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 both of our wives have 
gone for quite strange men. <laughs> You've painted your wife quite a lot. I mean, I, I've got a lovely um, print of your oh, yeah. wife. Um, do you find that stressful, painting people close to you? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, there's Just something... Just because they'll, re they'll respect you much less. <laughs> right. Yeah, it is, it is harder in the sense that... Um, but it, as it is with anyone who, who you know really well, because you know, you know all the little expressions they're capable of. Um, I, I always feel that the easiest pain things to do are the ones where you know people a bit already. So you haven't got this thing of trying to work out uh, yeah, who, who they are. Uh, yeah, do I, how, how do I get them to relax and be themselves? Are they being themselves? But at the same time, you don't know them so well that you know every little micro expression. And particularly the kids are the hardest. It's really hard to paint, paint my kids because, you know, Kids are harder to paint anyway because they, yeah, their faces, you know, there's not much showing in it yet. Yeah, as you get older, you've got the wrinkles and the wear and tear, and it's part of who you are because that's, you know, it's your biography. Everything that's happened to you, you know, is kind of like, well, at least a lot of it is has started to wear, show, you know, etch into your face. I haven't had any Botox, Johnny. This is a that's proper. Un that's unbelievable. This is a proper original, old, um, weathered. Naked chef right here. But it's a funny thing. I do, it's sometimes when you know, uh, people don't seem to mind how I make them look some, quite often, as long as I haven't made them look too much older than they are. Have you, um, have you found in lockdown period, creatively, it's been pushing you any different directions? Has it been good for your creative brain? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think anything that kind of like forces you just to like step back and take another view of things and question what you're doing is generally good. Um, sometimes it happens for bad reasons, but I think that definitely it's been a, a, a very interesting time creatively. It sort of reassured me that all the time I've spent exploring tech and portraiture from technical angles like 3D scanning um, and facial recognition and all the things where portraiture and technology overlaps at the moment in a really interesting way. I feel it's less crazy now because I think everyone's getting more interested in the technology and it's, moved, it's, it's moving on. And, and because of all this that's been going on, some things are going to move on that much faster now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but in terms of what I was going to just say also was, we've, I'll, I'll show it to you at the end actually, rather than bring it up there. But we, um, I think I, if I mentioned it to you, this, like, this AR app, uh, which, we, which was the kind of thing we've been working on in lockdown. And... It wasn't going to be designed to do this, but we just had an idea literally a week or two ago and tested it out where people can come and basically come into the studio while I'm doing this with you on the screen, painting happening and a holographic version of me doing the painting. Uh, and it could even be possible to do it in real time live, although it required quite a lot of setting up. I can see Ruben looking slightly terrified at how many different things there are to go wrong. But it also, I mean, even that, that kind of technology that you're working on, theoretically could even change the way I do things with food and cooking I and presenting. 100%. You could, people could be watching live while you're cooking something in your kitchen or you know, something like that. Or, yeah. And it all could be going out at the same time as a t your TV show's going out. They could be watching a sort of spatial version. Just, just because you're really good at your job, doesn't mean necessarily that anyone gives a shit, right? So, you know, so it's more than just technical talent. I do think that creating space in your life to be stressed yeah. and struggle a bit. I always used to sort of say that all my, yeah, all, all my best work has been done when I'm, you know, just unhappy enough. <laughs> Everyone generalizes struggle as, you know, one thing or another, but it comes in many forms, doesn't it? Struggle. And I think it's sort of how you use that to improve. I had, I had a Hodgkin's was a kind of cancer when I was 22. I think the perspective you get from that, and it was a time when I was then like trying to figure out whether to make a living as a painter and that kind of thing. And it made me much more gung-ho at a time when, you know, my sort of raw talent alone wouldn't have made it very obvious that I had to do that. I had such a good sympathy card to play with my parents and everyone else that I was basically able to get through that first couple of years when most people are forced to go and get a proper job. <laughs> um, it also, I, 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 I kind of felt in retrospect, 
enabled people to open up to me when I was painting them because they sort of there's some sort of sense that you know you've been through a lot you know you know therefore I can share my or my sort of hidden anguish or you know um, troubles or uncertainties with you uh, obviously I wouldn't you know necessarily um, choose to have done it that way if I had it was doing it again but certainly there was a lot of it that was really useful and so and it also means you almost anything else that comes along after that doesn't feel like a big deal. When you're playing around with me, mm -hmm. um, are you Touching you doing specific? <laughs> are you doing specific parts, or are you doing a bit of everything T during the sitting or separately? Well, like today, for instance, yeah. are you just like focused on my lips or, or <laughs> my cheeks or my ear, or, or do you do a bit of this, that, and the other? Um, I am. I guess instinctively I'm focusing on the parts which are the expressive parts which are your eyes your mouth and then the areas a bit around them eyebrows cheeks that sort of thing uh, with the result because then I tend to think think that other oh, hair and that's sort the of thing I and the, and this shirt I can leave that till when a little later or when he's not around um, but then I do have to remember to do give those bits a bit of love too the other thing I'd normally do when you if you're sat in here but it's harder over this is really just try and get the reflections and the, light, the tones of the light right, because that's very interesting when you're, someone's in the room, you can see that very precisely. And so that's the bit which I'm having to guess at a bit here. Yeah, because those are the things that you know, describe exactly the bit of your face, obviously, that's kind of facing a different direction, which you know, can actually kind of give you a lot of information about how someone's face is three-dimensionally without having to see it all. So that's, that, that's one of the bit, things that's slightly harder over this sort of process. But the fun thing is you're moving around a lot and the picture's slightly glitching and that's making for a very lively image. And so I'm enjoying it. The question for me is really whether I, at some point, the experimental side of it is getting a bit out of hand and actually I need to kind of like pull it back round to a bit of reality. Another thing you, I think you did, it was brilliant to highlight was people buying produce directly from the, the makers, you know, the sort of artisans, farmers, the farmers, and that's the thing, exactly. Yeah. The sort of homogenization of everything with supermarkets and Amazon and everything, you know, amazing operations that they are, is, is, a, is, is, is such a shame. It's all kind of divorcing everything from, you know, what it really is and how it's made. I think, generally speaking, the supermarkets have been amazing because they really have saved the government's bacon, really. Um, at the same time, um, yeah, I think people are realising that you can buy fish and cheese and and get fresh meat sent from Scotland to Essex if you want to. And actually, you can know the farmer, you can know the breed of cattle, you can um, you can know all the details that you would probably like to know about the food because you're going to put it in your body and swallow it. The one thing that's fascinating is um, basket data tells us that we all buy the same thing um, every week, week in, week out. And we only change it about four percent. So, From so one we're actually next. Yeah. So we're ve so we're really not open-minded at all. <laughs> no, I think what's been interesting is basket data doesn't lie. We lie. We all lie. If if you if you took a thousand nutritionists and got them to do a food diary, they'd all lie. We we know this from data that it's it's. And is, do you think people lie to themselves? Do you think they're kind of like, or do you think they're kind of convincing themselves that they behave better or differently to how we do? I think that? I think people lie for lots of reasons because they don't want to feel bad. But I think I think ultimately we know in science that food diaries are the least trustworthy source of information. One thing that is as pure as daylight is basket data because we also know if it's a family of four, you've got two dogs and a luxury guard, you know, and basket data is so proficient that it has been known to even know when women get pregnant before they do because they start buying different things that are pointing towards certain cravings <laughs> well, that was, that, was a walmart or something wasn't it kind of like famously sending um uh someone uh, adverts and coupons to, to like, like a, the dad of a 13 year old girl to... but what it's telling us is that we're really not as a as um uh adventurous as we think we are we all talk a good game but we buy the same shit every single week. So I think what, the, what lockdown has done is it has forced people to try new things because that's all that was available, um, or they've been more creative, or as those smaller businesses were able to start distributing, they've realized they're putting things in their mouth 
and they never realised how good that thing was. It's interesting. So back to this theme, like the creativity, that um, yeah, convenience is not good for creativity of any kind. Do you think that people get get the message with that sort of stuff? Because things like the kind of yeah, you know, the chlorinated chicken, which is going to become a you know, possibly hotly contested and discussed thing. Do you think that people will understand the sort of you know, enough people will understand the nuances of the debate of that to kind of um, to do the right things? Do you think that pro pro probably not? Because all the really important stuff is quite detailed, you know, agricultural or scientific things um, that are quite hard to explain quite simply. But so far, so good. It, it, it seems that the public um, at large and all different sort of demographics of the public um, do not want lesser quality sort of cheap imports flooding the market. They really do realise, uh, even the poorest communities, you know, the, the surveys that they've done, which have just done a survey, and, and it seems very clearly that they don't want to be just for the sake of price. They don't want to be fed, you know, um, flooded with, you know, lesser quality, lesser ethical, um, lesser nutritious, more unhealthy products. What we know for a fact is, you know, when daft trade deals are done, what happens is, is that a, a marketplace gets f flooded with loads of stuff that looks like the, the local stuff, but is way less quality and, and, and much cheaper to make. The farming of the more intensive systems has the power to obliterate the small business and the small farm. The poorer communities um, just end up getting more unhealthy. We know that, we can see. When bad, trade deal, when bad trade deals are done, the poorest communities suffer more. Um, what looks beautiful and cheaper and sort of bigger and, and like more choice, actually, you know, even if you go into LA, right, where I've worked a lot in LA, I know you have as well, you can see the Hollywood sign from a part of East LA where there's a 45 minute food de desert. So that means you cannot get fresh produce unless you get on a bus and do a 45 minute drive. And if you're busy and if you've got free jobs and if you're struggling, like the thing that is available locally is something that's packaged up very conveniently and is not gonna nourish your children. Or, or, and that's why they have terrible problems with type two diabetes and blindness and amputations and stuff like that. So as dramatic as that sounds, the reason, it's, the reason it's dramatic there is, be, is because it's become normalised. Is that kind of partly the, kind of like the power of big business over there? I think it's more than that. And, that's, and this is why this subject is so hard to tell, because everyone thinks, you know, like you might have one paper headline saying, oh, shut up, you middle class tossers, you know, just talking about nice ways to farm. You know, there's people over here that struggle with cash and they just want more, better, you know, more cheaper food. Like, why shouldn't they have, why shouldn't they have choice? Now, as simple as that argument is, what it doesn't tell you is, is there's a whole network of, of structure of business and farming and, and, and law. It's currently illegal to use hormones, growth hormones, in the production of, of meat production in the UK, right? Now, there's a handful of countries over there that will sell you the same steak, but cheaper, but do use it. Um, now, we know that it won't kill you, but we're pretty sure that it's not great for you and we don't, and we never truly trace the medium to long-term effect of having that ingested into your body. Now, it's the same with pesticides, herbicides. It's the same with the proactive use of antibiotics. What, what we're starting to learn, and, and I know it's a, a, hot, a hot potato subject, but we, we also know it from the poor the poorer communities that we must look after and take care of is that just because they're struggling doesn't mean they don't care about quality and it doesn't mean that they don't care about ethics um, so I think what we have at the moment in the UK is some of the best standards in the world all of that stuff that's going to happen on this trade deal stuff which as boring as it might sound to some people, is probably some of the biggest decisions in health and yeah, agriculture no. in the next hundred years. I think you're absolutely right. What you have in America, for instance, is a two-tiered system. And it's a system for the rich and a system for the poor. In Britain, yes, there are choices that are more expensive, but it's not a t our minimum standard in the UK across the whole of agriculture 
is some of the best in the world. So to put that into perspective, the food industry is the biggest on the planet. It's bigger than arms, it's bigger than oil, it's bigger than yeah, drugs, it's bigger than gold. It's, you know, the food industry is the biggest employer and the biggest business on the planet. And really, the only way is up. If we race down, then all of the stuff that everyone's talking about, environment, carbon, is a waste of time. Um, and everything that we're trying to work on to make sure that there is fairness with child health um, is, you know, so we'll see. At the moment, the government are doing a weird thing. They're kind of saying all the right things, but they are, Boris got all of his ministers to vote down an amendment that would assure farmers and the public that these standards would be held. So he, he's saying one thing and doing the absolute opposite. Look, Jamie, that's amazing. Thank you so much. I think we, I kind of got completely distracted by the conversation. It's funny, I always, I always get to the end of the sitting and think, oh, have I made it better or worse? I'm not sure. I don't know until <laughs> I come in the next day because I'm now used to seeing this and you and they're a bit different, but I can't really, yeah, it's a really hard thing to judge. I find it so, I never get it right when I try and do the whole thing in one day. Um, but it's great. I mean, it's definitely getting, much, it's getting more evolved all the time. Big love, mate. Have a lovely weekend. Yeah, love the um, jewels, um, everyone. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a cocktail in an hour oh. and I'll be cheersing you. Oh, likewise. It's, a, it's always a bit of like two steps forward, one step back. I, I think um, it's moving in the right direction. It's lively. We were having a bit of trouble with the Wi-Fi and so it was sometimes sharp, sometimes not. There's still things to be improved. The eyes aren't alive enough. The expression's kind of beginning to hit. I like that. I like it when it's hinting at a smile. I think that's always um, quite intriguing. You don't want someone actually smiling, but you want a sense that they might be about to. So, you know, that'll, that'll do for today. Uh, and hopefully also the next time I see you, I've had a haircut. Finally, we'll be allowed to. Um, so, uh, yeah, see you next time.